This episode of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time contribution, you can do that via check or PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. And so I want to give a special thank you to Andrew Cowum and Jonathan Gudino, who both just signed up this week to support us on Patreon. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. All right, so now let's get to our show. Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 434 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Today on the show, we'll be discussing the classic Foundation series by Isaac Asimov, which consists of seven novels published between 1951 and 1993. And this will include spoilers for the novels Foundation and Foundation and Empire, so just be aware of that. And I'm joined by three guests. So first up, we've got Anthony Ha, making his 21st appearance on the show. He covers media, advertising, and pop culture for TechCrunch, where he also hosts the podcast Original Content. A chapbook of his short stories called Love Songs for Monsters was published by Youth in Decline in 2014. And you should all go check out his TechCrunch article reading Isaac Asimov at 100. So Anthony, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me back. The next up, we've got John Kessel, making his sixth appearance on the show. He's the author of such novels as The Moon and the Other and Pride and Prometheus, and such short story collections as The Pure Product and The Bomb Plan for Financial Independence. He helped organize the creative writing MFA program at North Carolina State University and also served as its first director. So, John, welcome to the show. I'm glad to be back with you. And also joining us today is Abby Goldsmith. She's a graduate of the Odyssey Writers Workshop, and her work has appeared in Escape Pod and Fantasy Magazine. Her Torth series of space opera novels are available now on Wattpad, where they've racked up over 50,000 reads. She's also a co-host of the Stories for Nerds podcast, which just celebrated 100 episodes. So, Abby, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. All right, so let's start off with Anthony. So, Anthony, I think you told me that Foundation is one of your all-time favorite book series. Yeah, I um, I think I first read it, I don't know, maybe when I was 10 or 11, and at that point, I mean, I had read other science fiction. I think I'd read Dune. I'd read some Arthur C. Clarke. I'd read Hitchhiker's Guide. But um, I think Foundation was the series that made me realize that I was a science fiction fan. And I mean, initially made me realize I was an Isaac Asimov fan. And then um, when I kind of ran out of Asimov novels and short stories, I started reading his anthologies. And I realized that I was also a giant science fiction fan. So I both credit it for making me a science fiction fan and, and the original trilogy, um, as much as, you know, there, I know that it's, it's not perfect. Um, I also probably, it brings me as much pleasure as any book can when I reread it. So I, I probably end up rereading it every few years. So you, that was the first Asimov you'd read was foundation. That's right. Yes. Yeah. So what, what was it about it that, uh, do you think that you liked so much? I think it was the, well, certainly there's just the core idea of psychohistory and of the fall of the Galactic Empire that I found very compelling. I liked the sort of, I think I had been a long time, I had never maybe read a book before that covered, you know, these centuries of time and this like sweep of human history within, you know, a relatively short amount of pages. And I think stylistically, I know some people bounce off this, but I just really enjoy the description light, action light, but dialogue heavy style of especially the the early foundation stories. And to me, it's like all the stuff that my eyes sort of glaze over sometimes and I struggle with in other novels, all that stuff is gone from foundation and it's all argument and little bits of fun description and action, but, but kept to a minimum. And so I think they're just, I love the ideas, but I also just find them really fun to read. Hmm. So did you read the whole series or, or did, as a kid, or did you just read a certain subset of them? Oh, I, I read, yeah, I read all seven foundation books. And then I think I went back and read the robot books. And then I went and read the, the galactic empire novels. So as, as a child, I mean, or as a, say a uh, tween, or early teen, I, I knew the, the whole thing. And, and I mean, as an adult, I, I mostly returned to um, 
the original Foundation trilogy and the uh, early robot stories and novels. Although, for since I knew we were doing this and I reread the trilogy, I decided why not keep going and reread Foundation's Edge. Yeah, you are hardcore. You are definitely at the, in the right place. <laughs> Um, so how about John Kessel? So how did you, uh, kind of what's your history with foundation? Well, I'm the old dude in this conversation. And, uh, I, I was reading Asimov in the 1960s in, when I was, uh, in um, my mid teens and 13, 14, 15 years old, I, I, Asimov was, uh, he and Heinlein and Clark, uh, were the, my favorite science fiction writers and Asimov probably was my favorite of the three. So I read the, original trilogy back, uh, you know, in the, in the 60s and uh, really liked it. I, I um, you know, um, but it's strange. I hadn't, I, I, I went back and reread the trilogy for this podcast. So it was very interesting to me to go back after 50 some years and read it again. Uh, so there are many things I hadn't remembered. And, and it's interesting how I see it. I read differently than I did when I was 15. <laughs> so, uh, it, it, you know, I, 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 what I liked about it was it, it Asimov was very uh, logical. And so uh, it, it sort of pleased me as a young boy. Uh, I was sort of like a little computing machine when I was 15. And I, 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 um, I liked it that everything made sense and worked out. Uh, and, and then also he did surprise me. He had little twists of plot that he, he set up and that, uh, that appealed to me. Um, um, you know, reading it again, I think there's certain things that are, are born uh, to me that I hadn't remembered at all. Like, for instance, uh, as Anthony um, said in passing, there's almost no physical description of anything in in the books. And that's sort of interesting to me that you have this star spanning galactic empire with spaceships going, you know, thousands of parsecs and planets all over the place. And there's almost no physical description of anything. Uh, and and that that to me was very very interesting how how he could really tell a story and compel you really mostly with dialogue of two people sitting in a room usually smoking cigars. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, so did you? Um, I mean, the original plan I'll explain was we were just going to read and talk about the first book, Foundation, and then you and Anthony both said, "Oh, I actually read the whole trilogy." Um, so w w was it just you read the first one and you just couldn't stop or like what uh, sort of what compelled you to to keep reading for me uh, uh the thing was i remembered from when i was a kid the the best part of the trilogy um that for me was the story of the mule and that to me uh was in it's in the second book and so i had to read that yeah. <laughs> and then once i got that i i kept going uh it still seems to me that that's the best story part of of the of the trilogy the original trilogy uh, and actually, I've never read beyond the original trilogy, so I don't really know those later books. Yeah, so I guess I'll explain that I um, I was a really big Asimov fan as a kid. I, I loved his robot novels, and I read his memoir. Uh, it was called I, Asimov, which was really, you know, most of what I knew about what it was like to be a science fiction writer was just from reading that, because there were not a lot of books about, you know, the, the craft of or the business or whatever of being a science fiction writer, um, at least that I knew of back then. Um, but I, I could never get into Foundation. I tried to read it a few times, and I always got up to the part where um, Harry Seldon makes his kind of second appearance. Uh, I think was, like I read the first two stories. Basically, there's five stories in the book, and I always read the first two, and then kind of like uh, kind of lost momentum somewhere in the third story. Um, but then, you know, a couple months ago, uh, for for a panel, I read uh, Frank Herbert's Dune for the first time. And we got a uh, a really enthusiastic response to that. So I was kind of like, oh, well, well maybe uh, I can go read some of these other classics that I, I never actually got around to reading. Um, so I hope people enjoy this. Um, so, yeah, so I just read the, the first two books and uh, I've never read the third one. So uh, don't no spoilers. Don't don't tell me what happens. Um, but so, Abby, were you also were you also reading this for the first time or or not? You know, I, I gave it a try when I was a teenager, and it was too dry for me at the time. I couldn't get into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this, I mean, I think I, I sort of, I kind of read half the first, and then I skipped to the mule, because I heard so many good things about the mule. This is, again, when I was, I was a teenager. Um, and it was just the style. I just couldn't get into it at the time. So I was a little wary of giving it a try again, but I was like, you know, it's been 
a long time and I'm a writer now and, you know, let me give it a try. Um, and it really helped for me to kind of approach it with a more academic mindset, like keeping in mind the era that it was written in. And I found that I was, I really enjoyed it. I'm into it now. Yeah. Yeah. Let me, let me explain too. I, I forgot to mention is that, yeah. So I had, you know, we had planned to only read the first book and then I got halfway through the first book and I was like, wait, is there no mule in this? I, I, I thought there was a mule in this. And, <laughs> um, and I was like, oh crap, he's not until, the, I, I guess he's not until the second book. So then I very quickly read the second book and kind of twisted Abby's arm to, to read the second book as well. <laughs> so I appreciate Abby, uh, you know, doing extra double the work that you initially signed up for, you know, we appreciate that. Um, but yes. yeah, it's my pleasure. It was good. Yeah. <laughs> um, but so Anthony was saying that he likes the style that these are written in. Uh, I would have to say, well, maybe I'll save that for just a bit. I will say, let me just explain the <laughs> idea um, for people if you don't, if you're just listening to this cold. So, so the premise is that we're far in the future, so far in the future that humanity no longer remembers even on what planet humanity originated. And uh, the... Uh, the scientific discipline of psychology has developed to such a degree that it's evolved into a new science called psychohistory, which is a mathematical, statistical, sociological science that enables you to make extraordinarily accurate predictions about the wide sweeps of future history. And so we're in this galactic empire that spans like 100 million worlds or something like that. And um, Harry Selton, who's the foremost proponent of psychohistory, has seen, has projected that this empire is going to go through an, an, ine an inevitable fall. And the there's going to be a galactic dark age that's going to last for, is it 10,000 years? 10,000 10, years. And um, this can't, there's no way to prevent this, but it would be possible to shorten the dark age to a thousand years if uh, he establishes this foundation, this sort of scientific enterprise that's going to preserve knowledge and enlightenment through this dark age and help humanity rebuild afterward. And I think this is one of the best ideas anyone's ever had for a story in history. So let's start off with that. I really, really like the idea of this. Um, does everyone, does anyone not think that this is just in concept one of the best ideas for a story they've ever heard? I like the concept. Agreed. Yeah, I mean, um, I like how dramatized the mathematics and psychology are. You know, in, in our world, we think of math and science not so, not so interesting. But yeah, it's, it's just very dramatized, and I think those sciences were a little more fresh and new when it was written. So, right, I, I really like the concept. Uh, you know, I I studied physics as an undergrad, and basically, what he's doing is taking uh, classical thermodynamics and applying it to to human behavior. So uh, in thermodynamics, you can't predict what one atom is going to do. But if you have several billion atoms in a, in a, a contained box, uh, you can predict uh, uh, very precisely, you know, if you raise the temperature, exactly what the effect on pressure is going to be and things like that. And so he basically is saying, OK, if you have enough human beings, you know, you have 100 um, million worlds uh, all inhabited by human beings that uh, psychohistory sort of hand waves this uh, can can predict uh, the the mass behavior of human beings without being able to predict any individual human beings uh, uh, behavior. And, uh, you know, that's a cool idea. I, I, I've heard uh, who's the uh, New York Times economist. Paul, uh, Krugman. Paul Krugman. Paul Krugman was inspired by this to go into economics because he thought it was a wonderful idea. Uh, the idea of predicting uh, uh, mass behavior. Yeah. Yeah. I, I interviewed him about that, you know, episode years ago, if anyone's curious to hear more. Um, but yeah, and so from what I remember of Asimov's biography, he was a, I mean, he wrote these stories, uh, at least the first two books between the ages of, I think, about 21 and 31, or as when they were published anyway, um, during which time I think he was a PhD student in chemistry and possibly a professor of chemistry. Uh, I'm not sure exactly when he finished his PhD. But so, yeah, so obviously he knew a lot about science. And um, I think one of the real strengths of the books, reading them to me now, is how he, he talks about all the different elements on these planets and which ones would be valuable resources and things. And that, you know, I, I assume, you know, knew a lot about that from his studies of chemistry. And um, and that really lent a real sense of verisimilitude and sort of galactic economics to, to the series. Um, I don't know, Anthony, is there anything else about 
Do you know anything else about Asimov writing these? Oh, I, I, actually, well, go ahead, Anthony, if you know anything. Um, sure. I mean, I would just add that, you know, it's it's the original, the first three books were the ones that were all written for Astounding, for John Campbell at Astounding in the 40s. Um, and I think one thing that actually struck me this time that's kind of obvious in retrospect is just the fact that these were also written, I mean, especially the early stories were written in the early 40s during World War II. Um, and when I think at least some of them were written when he was both uh, serving basically, I think at, at um, I forget exactly wh- where, what it was, but basically a, a, a military research uh, station with Heinlein um, during the war. And then he was drafted immediately after the war ended. So I think to me, at least it seems clear that that's that, that the, the World War II is a lot of what's on his mind at the moment. Yeah, that was a naval air research station in Philadelphia where he worked with Heinlein and Elsprig de Camp uh, during the war. Yeah. One of the things I thought is interesting about the Foundation stories is that it's the entire galaxy that is inhabited by human beings who spread from the Earth over a long period of time. And there are no intelligent aliens in the entire galaxy. And I, that's because Campbell uh, insisted that in his stories that, in Astounding that no he, aliens could be smarter than human beings. And Asimov thought that was an absurd idea. So he decided if he's going, he couldn't give any alien, have any aliens who are smarter than humans, he would just have no aliens. <laughs> yeah, I, I can remember definitely, you know, the, the edition, it's unfortunately, it's not in this edition of this new edition of Foundation that I just ordered. But the edition that I had as a kid, it had an introduction from Asimov talking about how he came to write the Foundation stories. And um, I guess he would just, you know, he's at this point, I I guess he's like 19 or 20 or something. And he was just he had sold a few stories to Astounding. And so he would just swing by the offices and chat with John Campbell, the editor. And, um, you know, so so he had an appointment with John Campbell and he was supposed to pitch him an idea and he he didn't have anything. And so I found he says, um, I opened a book at random and set up free association, beginning with whatever I first saw. The book I had with me was a collection of the Gilbert and Sullivan plays. I happened to open it to a picture of the fairy queen of Yolantha throwing herself at the feet of Private Willis. I thought of soldiers, of military empires, of the Roman Empire, of a galactic empire. Aha. And so so he sort of pitched that to Campbell and Campbell liked it. And I I, I think sort of they they talked over a lot of the ideas together and kind of worked it out, um, you know, somewhat collaboratively. Um, I don't know if anyone else knows any more details about that. Yeah, I mean, my understanding is that a lot of the um, an early stories that Asimov wrote, it's it's a situation where Asimov and Campbell both gave each other a lot of credit. So there's some question of to what extent, like, I think Asimov basically said that Campbell came up with three laws of robotics and the initial idea for, for Nightfall. And, I've, and I think it seems like it was kind of a similar process here um, where, you know, Asimov had the initial inspiration, you know, Campbell probably had some feedback and there was, there was a lot of um, back and forth. I think the one other thing that, that maybe is worth mentioning in terms of just the, the context and writing of it is that um, the very first story in Foundation where we, I think it's called The, the Psycho Historians, and we meet Harry Seldon and, and we get that full idea of what the Foundation is and what psycho history is, is actually the, the last story written in the original trilogy and so when people were reading this in Astounding, the second story is actually what they started with. Um, and then it was only when it was being collected into book form that Asimov or the publisher decided, oh, we need one more story to actually kick the whole thing off. And I think, again, at least to me, it seems kind of clear that the um, that, that that story is a little bit, has a, you know, still not a lot of physical detail, but a little bit more detail a little bit more, it, it feels like the work of a slightly more mature writer, whereas the other stories in uh, the, the first Foundation book are, are a bit pulpier. That's that's funny because I didn't know that. And, you know, I, I was expecting this to be a real slog to, to read this because, as I said, I, I tried a few times when I was a teenager and couldn't get through it. And particularly, I was expecting the prose style to be just atrocious. And so I started reading the Psycho Historians and I was like, oh, this isn't, you know, this is better than I was expecting. And then we got into the encyclopedists and I was kind of like, oh, this kind of is as bad as I was expecting. (laughs) Um, So I I thought it definitely, you know, it definitely gets better as it goes. And the Psycho Historians, now that you mentioned that that was the the last one written, uh, that that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, 
but so um so anthony you know he said he really liked the style of these books and abby said especially when she was younger she found it sort of dry and couldn't get through it i had kind of a very similar experience um how about john what do you think of the prose i was pretty uh, uh indifferent to style when i started reading and so I was, I, you know, I, I felt that Asimov at his best writes a very clean kind of uh, a direct prose. He doesn't usually write any flowery language. He very seldom uses figurative language, you know, similes and metaphors, things like that. So I, I thought it read pretty well in, in my first time around. But then this time around, I, I saw lots of things that it really is fairly um, – I mean, there's some wonderful sentences. I marked one of them here. Uh, the mule is talking to somebody, and uh, he's the other guy's puzzled, and, and it says, "Chanis corrugated his forehead," <laughs> uh, or uh, uh, at any rate, there 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 are some kind of what pulpy pulpy uh, uh, a prose that that comes in here. It's it's. Uh, it's pretty. It's not really about the pro style, okay? And it's not really actually about the characterization much. Uh, it's mostly about the plot, and and so when he has a coup with the plot, that's I think what makes it most interesting. I think you know the character of the mule is probably the most interesting character in the in the story, uh, but uh, you know he has these good good uh, plot setups. I, I don't know how much you want us to give spoilers here. But um, the way it's set up from the beginning is Harry Seldon has plotted out what's going to happen for the next thousand years. And, he, in, and, and every time a crisis arises for the foundation uh, over the next 300 years, he has recorded a, a, a himself uh, addressing that crisis to the people who are living in this future time. And invariably, he knows exactly what's going on and he, he tells them what to do to get through it or how they should have gone or, or, you know, or sort of and analyzes how they did get through it uh, until there's a point where he, they, they all, they get so complacent about the fact that, well, Harry Seldon's plan is, is invariable. We don't even know what it is, but it's working and we don't have to do anything to really make it happen. It'll just happen. Uh, and then some crisis arises where the, the, they know that Harry Seldon's going to appear and make a statement and they all gather to hear him speak and, and he appears and speaks, and what he's talking about has nothing to do with the crisis that they're going through right then, which is like uh, you know pulling the rug out from under the premise that's powered the first two thirds of this book, uh, or or more, or further more than that. And so that that to me was a uh, wonderful. I remember when I was a kid, I thought that was terrific. I mean, it gets it gets interesting. You know, if if the characters always have an answer to every problem, then it sort of becomes uh, tedious. But then when something goes wrong, that's when a story becomes interesting. Yeah, well, I, I totally agree with that. And just to explain, so there's there's these first two books. The first book has five stories in it, and the second book has two much longer stories in it. And the second one is called The Mule, and that's the scene you're describing happens in that one. And um, and they're pretty much self-contained stories. I mean, I think you could you could read them out, you know, independently. And, and, you know, each one is far enough in the future from the last one that, um, they're, they're all different, usually different, completely different set of characters and so on. But I want to, I want to stick with the pro style just for a second, because you mentioned a line, uh, that, you know, John quoted a line. I'm just going to quote a line here because I feel like so much of the text of this book is just physical descriptions of body language that are completely superfluous and often just very strange. Um, so the one I marked here is Sut raised somber eyes, which seem to retreat into their sockets. And this is a description of a human, right? It's not a description of a, <laughs> you know, a slug or snail or something, right? So it's it's just like so much of that is just just felt just really clunky to me, even though, as I said, I love the ideas so much. Um, and I want to get Abby back in here. So you said that I think the first time you tried to read it, you found it sort of dry. What did you think of just the the pro style and the characterization and stuff like that, reading it now. Yeah. I'd say the strength he has is dialogue. Um, you know, you're right. The descriptions are really, really lacking. They're very, they, they kind of show up again in books two and three. So it's like you said, it's a more mature writer in those later books. Um, the first book is really bare bones, but yeah, the dialogue I thought was actually pretty good. That's kind of what holds it up. Yeah. 
Do I, I mean I, I I felt like the the characters that I can remember are like Harry Seldon I have a very clear image of and the Mule I have a very clear image of, and the rest of the characters all sort of blur together for the most part. Um, how do you feel about that, Abby? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'd say that, and also e- even just the the descriptions of the world and the technology. Um, you know, it, of course, it's a little bit retro by today's standards, but um. Yeah, it's it's all it's more idea based. You know, there's not a whole lot of description in there. Yeah, yeah there's a. Uh, I think that you know the the fact that he does proceed by dialogue. There's almost no sen- sensory input in the in the prose here. You know, you don't get a sense of color or shape or vistas of s- scenery or weather. Even <laughs> uh, there there's a, a, a just a, a and the characters are mostly names. You might say, oh, he's tall, and and then every time the character comes on, it's 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 mentioned that he's tall or he has a large nose or something like that. But that's it. You know, uh, he doesn't really invest in these people as people. Uh, uh, but but he is very interested in the in the 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 conflict between uh, uh, factions, say about some you know historical event that that is occurring uh, or the politics of it. There's a lot of politics in this, which may be one reason why uh, Krugman uh, was interested as well. Um, so so uh, you know if you're looking for uh, evocative portraits of uh, distant planets, uh, sort of what you get in Dune, when you do get that in Dune, you're not going to get that in Asimov. Uh, but I'm quite interested, actually, and in, I know that they're, a- Apple TV is making a series of this, and it seems to me that the stories present enough plot and, and characters, we don't, but there's space for the, the filmmakers to, uh, to deepen these things. There's so much space, there's a tremendous amount of space to give these people personal lives and and personalities, and and not only to show us things that are really not shown to us in the, in the, uh, in the books, and so that to me suggests that a lot of times when you see uh, something you've read uh, adapted to film or TV, you compare it to the book it, uh, usually often unfavorably. But in, in this case, I think that uh, you know they'd be well served to to add a lot of things of their own to what Asimov gives you. Uh, because there's a lot of stuff that's not in there. Yeah, I, I would have sort of expect from watching the trailer, which I thought looked really, really cool, I would sort of expect they're going to take sort of the broad outlines of the stories and kind of invent their own characters. I mean, the main character who seems to be the main character in the trailer is a, a young woman of color who right. I'm not sure if she's, uh, if any specific character in the book, uh, you know, relates to her or not. Actually, but, uh, I think that she's, she's, their version of Gal Dornick, who is a man, yes. a young man in the in the book, but I think they've gone and made it a a, a, a young woman of color, which is I think is is a good thing to do. Yeah, Anthony, were you saying saying something? No, I, I just that that I think um, they're they gender flipped, and I mean I don't think you ever find out what what Gal Dornick's race is, but <laughs> sort of I think everyone in Foundation is sort of, with maybe a few exceptions, is implicitly white. Um, so they've like also like switched the the race of the character, and I think all of that's great. And I mean and that speaks to part of John's point that because um, I think there's a, a strong spine in terms of story, but like so much of the rest of it is essentially blank. There's a lot of opportunity for the showrunners and directors and actors to expand on that and and to you know i think that i would i would absolutely expect them to um change things up um in terms of and just for one thing make it a much more diverse cast of characters i mean i I think the, the other question on that front is just um that one of the things that's that would be challenging about adapting the trilogy is not just the characters with maybe two exceptions are relatively unmemorable and interchangeable but also that they change like <laughs> in every story and so to what extent is it going to have to be an anthology show that i mean harry selden is also a big part of the that trailer um and so to what extent is like the first season you're going to see harry selden and he maybe dies halfway through or but like you know in in the in the books he's in 20 pages and then <laughs> is gone and so and then, and then we meet, you know, um, Salvor Hardin and Hober Mallow, but like they all are gone within a few pages. And so if you're following a show to follow a set of characters, I think it, I, I'm really curious to see how they deal with that problem. 
Yeah. So how about Abby? What did you think of the trailer? Did you watch it? Oh, I didn't see the trailer, but I'm interested now. I definitely will see it. Um, yeah, I think they can do it. I think um, I was thinking about it because, you know, you, you see shows like Black Mirror. Um, you can definitely have kind of uh, I was originally thinking they could just adapt the mule, like Beta and the mule, that whole story, which is a pretty large novella for a season. But um, it might be good to give it like a prelude, a few episodes of prelude to show what cells and crises are. Yeah, I'm not sure what they're going to do. I mean, from the um, the trailer, it looks like everything was from the Psycho Historians, that first piece, as far as I could tell. Um, and we didn't see what else they might be planning to do. I mean, I actually, you know, because Foundation has such a reputation for being sort of no action and uh, a lot of talking and, and so on. I was sort of thinking it would be very difficult to adapt it into a TV show. And actually having read it, there's actually a lot more in there that I think would be visually interesting. I mean, I agree overall with John that the, you know, it doesn't generally describe sweeping vistas and so on. With the the one big exception to that, I would say, is when the characters arrive on Trantor for the first time. Uh, I thought that that was actually pretty pretty cool. And the whole description of the uh, the landing process and the spaceport and the um, the bureaucratic procedures and this sort of institutionalized bribery and everything. Uh, I could see that being that, you know, translating to television really well. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how they're going to deal with the constantly introducing a, a whole new slate of characters. Um, right. Since you're jumping ahead in time, 50 or a hundred years from story to story. So yeah, it's going to be harder to have continuity if they do that. Um, yeah. Yeah. One of the things I thought was interesting in rereading it was, um, it, you know, it pretty much feels like a white male world, except there are some significant female characters, at least uh, as in the second book and then in the third book, too. Um, and I, I was curious as to how he handled them, because in some places I think he sees, uh, you know, it, it's really curious to read this, uh, you know, story set 30,000 or whatever years in the future that so much of it seems like 1943 in the United States. And so, uh, but that's pretty much a problem of any science fiction. It seems to me you, you are bound by the imagination. Uh, you, you don't really, so that, so that, you know, in one hand you have psychohistory and you have all these vastly uh, different inhabited planets. On the other hand, people are, are smoking cigars, uh, a lot of cigar smoking, which is weird because I don't think Asimov <laughs> himself smoked. But somehow I, that was, I think, a, a symbol of of someone being, a, uh, you know, a, an adult male who's in a position of authority smokes cigars. OK, yeah. so 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 that that's a little shorthand there. Uh, and there's a scene actually where where a woman walks into one of these uh, meetings and uh, uh, they offered her to tr sort of try to make fun of her. Uh, 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 you know, some cigars, and she accepted one with a smile, it says, and drew in its aromatic smoke with all the relish one could expect. Lee Center repressed a scandalized emotion. <laughs> <laughs> so so the women, I think, uh, are also, the expectation is that the women will, will be 1942 women. Uh, but uh, but he does, he does try to do some things with the, with the female characters. Well, yeah, from what I remember from his memoir, not only did he not smoke, I mean, I don't know if he ever did, but I, I distinctly remember that his first marriage was kind of a disaster because his wife smoked and he just couldn't, you know, it was a huge source of uh, disagreement, um, you know, when they were living together. Well, maybe um, he was scandalized about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so I mean, I actually, I definitely, I mean, in the first book, I actually made a note like female character exclamation point on page 230. Um, when yeah. I, oh, she wore a dress. <laughs> yeah. When, when, well, 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 yeah. So, so there are these two female characters. I don't think literally the existence of women has been noted up until this point. I could be well, wrong. I would say actually to me that one of the most striking lines is in the psycho historians where um, there's a scene where uh, Selden is being interrogated by like the, I forget exactly what the title is, but basically the, the Lords of the Galactic Empire. And the prosecutor says, don't you have a hundred thousand people on, on your project? He says, no, I have 50. He says, no, I count a hundred thousand. And then he says, as if it's this amazing zinger, I believe you are counting women and children. And it's sort of implied <laughs> that obviously anyone who does anything worthwhile on this project is an adult man. 
Right. Okay. So, so maybe that's an exception, but, but pretty much there's no mention of women up until page 230, where we're introduced to two women who exist in order to make the point that women will do anything for a pretty dress, basically. Um, and that this has economic consequences, galactic economic consequences. Um, so, so Abby, what did you think of, I assume that this is something you noticed while you were reading? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was something, honestly, <laughs> I was reading it out loud with my partner and we both kind of were making fun of that scene and laughing. It's like, oh, she, she's twirling around her dress. Amazing. Uh, but, but, you know, it was, um, I, I thought he did a good job with the character of Beta in the next novel. So it's interesting, like he, in the space of about a year, because I think it was just published the year after, he did kind of, that. I just kind of shows that it was just his attitude, the attitudes of the day. Well, I think though, that, I mean, the, I think the novels were published a year apart, but they were collecting stories that had been published over the previous decade. So I think oh. that the, the mule was written, you know, some number of years after the encyclopedists. Um... But yeah, so I th like definitely so in the in the mule, which I think we all agree is the best, you know, the best section of this, of, at least certainly these two books. Um, the, you, beta is the, yeah. There's the, a woman beta who's more or less the main character. I mean, there's like it's sort of a little bit of an ensemble, but you know, she's certainly as important as any of the other. Or gets as much screen time as any of the other characters, and um, it's at least the point is at least made that. She's from, as someone as a woman from the foundation, she regards herself or is regarded on her home world as equal to the men. Um, so, I mean, there's that. Um, what did uh, what did um, Anthony, what do you think of, of, of Beta? Um, I, you know, uh, certainly appreciated just the seeing a, a woman sort of driving the action. Um, I, you know, again, I couldn't really tell you much about her as a person. She's definitely, I don't think necessarily much more memorable than any of the male protagonists, but just the fact that she's a woman, I think is, is remarkable. Um, I mean, it shouldn't be. And <laughs> I think dates these books very badly, the fact that that's the case, but um, you know, I, I do like, I mean, also the, a lot of her interaction with the mule and how that plays out over the course of the story. I mean, that said, I mean, I think part of the reason why she is a woman is because a lot of how the ending plays out and her relationship with the mule is gendered. Um, and so there's like a slightly less feminist reason for her to be the, the lead in the story. Um, the other thing that was striking to me this time rereading, I would mentioned thinking about World War II, and there's a section in the mule where Beta is working on one of the... Um, Terminus has already fallen, but one of the planets controlled by the uh, traitors, they, they've sort of taken refuge there. I think Haven is what it's called. And um, and that's like the one time we actually see women who aren't just functioning as, as wives and mothers, but actually working in industrial settings. And to me, that seemed like an obvious reflection of the kind of temporary, in some cases, movement of women into those roles during World War II and that it was like this kind of, um, you know, Rosie the Riveter kind of, uh, that, that, that it was, that the whole books, all of the books reflect this idea of, I think he, that he, that, that there's a, that he's a, there's a willingness to treat women with some seriousness as people and characters, but that fundamentally he sees at least in, in these early stories, um, the men is the movers and shakers of the universe, right? The, the doers, the thinkers. Um, and, and even it feels like the exceptions to that case feel very, very much like exceptions that just reinforce that broader point. He, he does uh, give Beta really the, the fundamental, you know, final plot twist of, of that uh, second half of the book. Uh, it all, I mean, she is the main character in the sense that, that her, she's, she's figured out things that other people haven't figured out. And she's her, her relationship to the mule and her understanding of what's going on, I think are, are really uh, uh, central to that story. And that's, you know, for someone who started where Asimov did, and I think he was writing this later, you know, uh, I think it, he was was stretching himself in a way that you know, maybe he didn't create the most convincing and three dimensional female character, but he was 
doing something that a lot of um, the stories in Astounding Science Fiction of that era would not have done, uh, to give a, a woman character the agency that she is given as much as she is. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I think he deserves kudos for that. Yeah. But yeah, I remember he, he does mention, uh, you know, it's just funny. He describes her as being pretty, but also he, I was talking about how plump she is. I don't know what that's about. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I think her physical description is supposed to be based on his, his first wife before he, you know, the marriage had maybe gone uh, more downhill that this was sort of a tribute to her. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think the, you know, the, it's going to win awards for, you know, complex female characters but i mean you know like her um her husband whose name I, I don't even remember it was like something sort of like falcon you know is is a Turan. very stereotypical Turan, yes Turan, yeah is a very, very <laughs> stip, tip, uh, stereotypical male kind of character so like you know uh by comparison beta you know is is, is not is you know reasonably well developed but um uh, I, but I thought it was interesting what John was observing that this is sort of you kind of have to read these stories in the context of pulp science fiction. Um, and you can sort of it's, it's actually really interesting to see, like, how many trappings of the of, of pulp science fiction there are in here in terms of, you know, the hyperspace jumps and the personal defense shields and, you know, yeah, like galactic soldiers and, you know, all these heists and everything. Um but it, but it's clear that Asimov is taking that material and trying to do something really, really, really smart and ambitious with it um, that I think was at the time, you know, I mean, even now it strikes me as impressive, you know, especially for someone who is in his 20s writing most of these stories. But I think at that time must have been, you know, a real, you know, really striking to, to people reading the science fiction magazines. Yeah, I think uh, one of the things that's interesting to me is because there was a history in the 30s of uh, you know these galactic adventures with uh, you know E. e. Doc Smith with w planets blowing blowing up planets and you know vast space armies g clashing uh, spaceships uh, uh, and and there that stuff is going on in the in the, in these books, but it's almost always off stage. Uh, you never, I don't think there's ever a, a description of a you know a battle like you'd see in a Star Wars movie, say between two fleets of of spaceships, or uh, um, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, you know, everyone in the story is carrying a blaster, which I love. I, I want to have a blaster when I grow up. <laughs> uh, but but uh, but I don't think there's only one person who ever shoots a blaster and kills somebody in in, in the trilogy. Okay, uh, on stage. All right. I I don't think that that ever. You know, that sort of uh daring do swashbuckling star wars version of the future the galactic empire is is sort of um uh, alluded to but it's not really front and center in the story you know what i mean yeah i mean the only things that strike me are um you know uh there's the assassination attempt on the mule which doesn't get super actiony but it has a little bit of a you know you know thriller kind of aspect to it and then, so the the in the third story, the foundation has sort of set up a um like a religion. Uh, they they've sort of made a foundation religion that the the people who um run the nuclear plants uh, have been indoctrinated into. And there's a when when a, a fleet is coming to invade the foundation, uh, they declare them all bla they declare the hostile power blasphemers, and the crew crew rises up and sort of mutinies and and takes control of the ship. And those are the things that jump out at me as being in, in any way, uh, sort of visual action. I think there are a few other scenes that are set on ships either before or after battles. And, but yeah, what's striking about them is they're almost never the captain at the bridge in a battle. It's, oh, then they spotted the enemy ships, end of section. <laughs> or, uh, oh, let's have a discussion about whether or not we should take the, you know, what we should do to prepare for the battle. Um, it, it's never like, yeah, it, it seems completely uninterested in, in the actual combat. I kind of like that. I mean, oh, I love you that. Know, yeah. Yeah. A lot of times in, in, in fiction, battle scenes can get repetitive and boring. I think a lot of writers don't really, you know, give them the suspense that they need. Um, so he kind of could just skip that. He's like, oh, let's just skip the boring parts and go straight to like the, you know, gotcha dialogue. 
I agree. I think, uh, you know, it's it's sort of refreshing to not have, uh, uh, you know, Han Solo. Oh, there's a character named Han in here, isn't there? I yes. wonder if... if uh, Han Fisher, yeah. Yeah, if uh, Lucas had taken the name from that. But Han Solo doesn't... He, actually, Han Fisher is closest to Han Solo we get in this trilogy, all right? But uh, he, he really isn't the hero of the story uh, to speak of. There were there were a couple lines that I'm pretty sure got lifted straight out of this and put in Star Wars. I mean, there was one about, you know, we got to make the calculations careful or we could bounce through a star or something like that, where I'm kind of like, I'm pretty sure this got lifted. Um, well, in, in Trantor is clearly uh, the, yeah, the Coruscant. Uh, galactic cap. Right, exactly. I think uh, Lucas had his copy of Foundation sitting open on his desk when he was working on the screenplays. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I, I bet. Yeah, well, I actually, um, the things that, you know, the later things that this reminded me of the most reading it, I made a little list. Oh, well, first of all, yeah, like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, um, you know, the Encyclopedia Galactica and the Sub-Ether communication device is lifted straight out of um, Foundation. Um, a lot of this reminded me of Dune a lot, having just read Dune. I actually read a, a note somewhere that someone said that Frank Herbert had had gotten the idea for Dune. He read Foundation and thought about telling that story from the point of view of the mule, and that was kind of like the seed of um, uh, of Dune. Hmm. But I, I, I don't, um, I haven't tracked any more down about that. And then also, I don't know if uh, any of you have read Ian M. Banks's Culture series, but just this idea of this sort of more enlightened galactic civilization who bumps up against these less enlightened ones and sends agents into them to sort of make them collapse from within without fighting because they don't like to fight. Um, you know, having not read Foundation before, I first encountered that in culture. But, you know, now reading this, I'm like, oh, OK, I, I think he must he was pretty clearly riffing off Foundation. Yeah, I've, I've read a few of the culture novels, and I mean, I think that 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 influence is definitely there. It's, it can be hard to see, at least because the the ones that I've read um, consider Phlebas and use of weapons. They, you only sort of see the culture kind of in these sort of sidelong glances, um, and which is part of what's really different about how Banks treats this is that I, he doesn't sort of build this future history, which you can sort of see very clearly in your mind. Um, but it does feel like in a lot of ways that, I mean, even though obviously the idea of galactic empires and things like that, predates Asimov, like this is in a lot of ways kind of the one of the definitive treatments that anyone who came afterwards and you were dealing with a sort of a, you know, galactic human civilization that you were going to be, you know, in the shadow of foundation to some extent. Yeah, well, you should read um, Player of Games because I think that goes more into what it's like in the culture. But just the this idea that gets quoted a lot, um, violence is the last refuge of the incompetent. That's um, you know something that originates with Asimov that I think echoes yeah, echoes in, in Banks as well. Um, how about how about Abby? Does this uh, reading this did it make you think like oh things that other things I've read have clearly been influenced by this? Um, I mean it's interesting. I, I actually did read Player of Games, um, and I didn't see. <laughs> I did not see. The <laughs> <laughs> but, um, well, but, read it again because yeah. it's there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, but now that you said that, I think I do see what you mean. Um, you know, it is kind of this enlightened civilization, galactic civilization that's got its tentacles everywhere. Um, and yeah, I mean, you know, I've seen it in Greg Egan's work, Diaspora. Um, I mean, I could, it, there's plenty of sci-fi authors that have, you know, large spacefaring galactic civilizations. Um, and yeah. But I think, I mean, I think there's lots that, as John was saying, there's lots that fight, you know, that have big, like, naval-style engagements and things like that. But this idea of not fighting, of, of using psychology and uh, economics and stuff as your weapons, I, I think is sort of distinctive to... It uh, is. Yeah, and, it, and actually, Greg Egan's Diaspora does kind of do that. So I guess that's why that one popped into my head. Yeah. How about John? What do you think about that? Well, I mean, you know, I think that uh, Asimov as a person was not... You know, he was a guy essentially had agoraphobia, he didn't like to leave his apartment. So uh, I think that, uh, you know, in some ways this reflects his his personality that, you know, and, and when everyone else is doing galactic space battles, maybe it's a, a smart move to to say, oh, no, you know, the guys with the, doing daring do with their their laser weapons their blasters are 
you know, there, there are a dime a dozen. And, you know, what about a, a political story or an economic story? Yeah, stories that, that engage with, because I think that Asimov would probably say that in the larger uh, sweep of history, those forces of politics and economics are more uh, uh, significant than any individual battle or war. Uh, I think that, that that sort of reflects his vision of the, of the world. What do you think, John, about just psychohistory as a, I don't know, as, as a idea in, did you, are you able to suspend disbelief uh, reading these series that, that it's, it would be possible to have something like that? I think it's, uh, I, I'm pretty skeptical of that, but for the sake of the premise of the novel, I think it works well enough. Um, I don't know. Um, you know, the, the way that it's set up is, you know, uh, um, Harry Sullivan says, well, there's a 97.6% chance that, uh, you know, 250 years from now X will be happening. And I think that's very unlikely. Uh, you know, it's one thing that they didn't know about chaos theory back then. And, and so, you know, sensitive dependence on initial conditions suggests that, and I think actually the, the world and history is more of a chaotic system so that you can predict something. It's like weather. Okay. You can't, it, it, back in the day, you know, the classical physicists and people thought that if you could, if you could measure everything, then you could predict the weather indefinitely for forever. Okay. For 10 years, 10 days, 10 years, you know, 10, 10 decades. But um, we know now that that would, that's impossible. And I think that's sort of the situation with history. I, I, I tend to feel that that's that. But but for the sake of a story, a science fiction story, I, I don't know that, you know, it bothers me to, to that he, he chose to do that. It gets a little. Actually, one of the things I really like is that the that psychohistory, you know, fails uh, and uh, at least for a while. Then by the end of the book books, it's come come back full force. <laughs> yeah. So I, I don't know how I feel about that. I don't, I don't really uh, tend to, to uh, uh, feel that that's likely. Well, I mean, I, I tend to agree with you, but just for the sake of argument, I was, I was kind of thinking that, you know, when you look back at the broad sweep of history, a lot of things do seem sort of inevitable, right? Like, you know, monarchs have to give up their absolute power. Slavery gets abolished. You know, women get the right to vote. It's, it's, it, I mean, I can see outlier scenarios in which these things didn't happen, but it doesn't seem crazy to me that you could say with a 94% um, accuracy rate or sort of confidence that, that these things were going to happen in the next, over the next 300 years or whatever. Well, I, 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 I take your point. No, I think that that's right. There, there are, are, you know, there's that idea of what do they call steam engine time where the idea that when technology gets to a certain point, uh, not just one person, but a number of people are going to invent the same thing because it's time to invent that thing. Yeah, I noticed there was a lot of like um, echoes of the Roman Empire, the fall of the Roman Empire. Um, I just listened to the Mike Duncan podcast on that, which is a very long podcast. Um, just the whole period where there's like pettier and pettier emperors in charge and these viceroys, which kind of echoes the British Navy. Um, so he was kind of pulling quite a lot from history, I thought. Yeah, I think he mentions explicitly um, Edward Gibbons' rise and fall of the Roman Empire. Um, decline and fall. Uh, sorry, <laughs> decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Um, I know, Anthony, do you have any, what's your take on psychohistory? Yeah, I mean, I see it. I, I mean, I do think it, that it is, you know, fundamentally, I mean, in the, the same as the three laws of robotics, um, I think it's fundamentally a fictional idea, not um, one that I, he sort of, you know, clearly extrapolated from existing science. But I think it's like very compelling for that reason. I think that fictionally, it works really well, because he comes up with these constraints that we can't make individual predict predictions about individual behavior. We can only make predictions about societal behavior that, um, you know, a mutant like the mule is not predictable by psychohistory. And, and so I think in the context of the books, it's very compelling. Um, I think it's also just like you were saying at the very beginning, it's just a, like a really cool idea and you want it to exist on some level. And the, I mean, the, when I think about psychohistory the most is like when I'm just like constantly checking 538 to see their predictions <laughs> of what the uh, presidential election is going to turn out. And, and so, I mean, as this aspirational idea of like, how could we 
you know, quantify and, and, and create a science around futurology, like, I, I find it compelling, even if I'm not necessarily convinced that it'll ever, that if, that it will ever exist, or if it does exist, it would exist in the, um, in the form that it does in the books. I think one other thing that's interesting about it is what's implicit, I think, in the initial trilogy and that he states outright in the, when he wrote the sequels in the 80s is that psychohistory can't really predict technological change. And so um, that one of the things that work, the, the reason the foundation succeeds partly in, and the psychohistory is able to predict that success is because you're in this period of technological decay and that like, it's not so much that new things are being invented, but in fact, that these outlying provinces of the galaxy are losing the technology they already have. But um, I think in the same way that psychohistory can't predict the mule, it couldn't predict necessarily predict um, if there were, you know, some other planet had this huge technological breakthrough. Although I guess part of the argument maybe is, is of the steam engine time argument is that um, technological breakthroughs are to some extent historically determined. Um, and I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't have a good answer for that, but I think that's an interesting question as well. What, what do you think about um, space empires or space civilizations going back to fossil fuels and coal? It seems like, again, uh, <laughs> I haven't, you know, necessarily, I think it's certainly in the context of the, the books, I accepted it. Um, I, I think there's sometimes maybe a little bit of a neatness to it where you wonder, I mean, and, and this is true sort of any kind of post-apocalyptic type or like societal decline story where you think that it's not quite so simple as that, that I would imagine there are some things that even as society is quote unquote decaying, there are some things that get preserved and, and survive in strange ways rather than, okay, we just go back to, to some, to what we would see, what they would see as a kind of barbarism. But um, I like just, I like the way it sort of resists this idea of unending upwards technological progress um, and, and the idea that instead his, there are maybe periods of rapid technological development and then periods where we decelerate or actually lose some of those developments. I mean, John, what do you think about that? Well, it's funny. As I was reading this, I was thinking about our current political situation where different people are jockeying for power. And we essentially have a strong man who is the president of the United States now uh, uh, in the sense that he wants to wield the power without having the, the uh, you know, this, the Roman Senate is not going to control President Trump. And so uh, in, in that that to me was was uh, ironic in that that some of the things that Asma was saying, which I think he clearly was taking from the Roman Empire, you know, could be applied in, in, a, in at least a mild way to the sort of societal issues we're we're dealing with now that that, uh, uh, you know, the political power is being. You know, and then, then now that there's also like people rejecting uh, uh, you know, scientific advance, uh, uh, deliberately saying, no, we're not going to do that. Forget about the vaccinations. <laughs> so uh, uh, that to me is uh, was was, you know, more plausible than it might have seemed actually when I was when I was younger. I guess the, the issue that it struck me is that, um, you know, they can't find anyone who knows how to run a nuclear power plant anymore even mm -hmm. though they have hyperspace and in a very short time can get to like a hundred twenty million solar systems or something like that. And there seems to be like, like a, like a difficulty there of like knowledge being lost when it's so easy to get to so many places and contact so many different people. Yeah, I think that's, that's a very good point. Um, it does seem a little bit incongruous that, you know, they could still have hyperspace travel while they're using coal to heat their houses. <laughs> Yeah, I felt it had a little bit of a Jetsons vibe where, you know, jumping in your spaceship is like jumping in your car. Um, and I think that is a factor where it's like some galactic fiction. It makes the gla the galaxy seem very small, like a lot smaller than it actually is. Um, and it had that that effect to me. Yeah, I mean, I was also just wondering about the logistics of, you know, you have an emperor ruling over 20 million solar systems or something like how much time obviously like how much time can you spend getting right. up to date on this planet you know not not much you would you would think 
No, well, actually, I think the whole thing won't bear intellectual inspection. You just don't want to think too much about how you have a an, an hundred million stars in the Milky Way galaxy, and and they're all inhabited by human beings. All these solar systems. It's just just doesn't really, um, you know, we're we're. I'm. I don't think we're going to have hyperdrive. Okay, <laughs> we're not going to make it to Alpha Centauri. If we do, uh, that'll be about it. Uh, wait, you're saying that you we will only make it to Alpha Centauri? Yeah, I think that the the premises of you know human beings expanding outward and settling every habitable planet in the Milky Way galaxy is is uh, it's crazy. <laughs> well, but this is one of the um, the things that comes out of discussions of the Drake equation and stuff like that, right? Is that if it's an exponential expan, if it's possible to get to another star at all then right. that would start an exponential process, which would fill up the whole galaxy surprisingly quickly. I forget all the math, but... Well, um, you better better be able to go faster than the speed of light, it seems to me. I don't know. I mean, the distances are huge. So, But, but if you had, you know, like robot ships with um, embryos uh, on them or something like that, I mean, it doesn't really matter how long it would take, right? Well, that sounds like a really good topic for a discussion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And why is it just one galaxy? Why can't they go to the other galaxies if... Um, I mean, <laughs> if they have a hyperdrive, yes. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, one of the things that I think is interesting about the treatment of hyperspace is that, at least in if if you take the idea seriously, then on some level, physical distance no longer matters, and the idea of a galactic center and a galactic periphery doesn't really make as much sense. And yet, the the stories are still tied to the idea that, you know. There, that proximity to transfer matters, that being in the galactic center matters. And, and I mean, I think there's some hand waving towards why that's the case, that it's, you can't just jump in a ship and immediately hyperdrive to anywhere. You have to like get far away from a, uh, from a, a, a gravity source. You have to sort of calculate a number of different jumps to get where you're going. But it, it feels like in some ways that he was like, okay, well, the only way I feel like we can have faster than life travel is through this hyperdrive or, you know, by these hyperspace jumps. And then I have to come up with all these constraints so that people aren't just jumping from one end of the galaxy to the other instantly. Well, I, I, I think from Asimov's point of view, the, you know, he, he wanted a Roman empire and he wanted a galactic mm -hmm. Roman empire. And so he had to have some means of travel. And so the, the thing, and the analogy works out that it's sort of like the, Roman Empire, where you have Rome, and then you have the far-flung provinces out, you know, which is ne which are reached by sh sailing ships. Okay, and so, so uh, you know, it works roughly in the same same way. Uh, and the provinces uh, get lost in, in the while the center still uh, uh, holds uh, is organized, and and um, you know, uh, to me, that's that's a sort of storytelling uh, assumption that that. I don't know how much you, I mean, you come up with science fiction explanations for these things, but um, it's sort of hand waving to me. Yeah. Just on that analogy between the, uh, between this and the Roman empire, I just wanted to read one line. So there's, there's a part where um, one of the characters says, uh, this is after the foundation has declined. Um, but one of the characters says, they say that not the highest nobility of the galaxy could achieve the honor and deference considered only the natural due of a simple man who could say, I am a citizen of the foundation. And this is a very obvious reference to the Latin phrase civis Romanus sum, which means I am a citizen of Rome, uh, which at least in, in reputation in history, if you said that you were safe anywhere you traveled within the Roman Empire, because everyone was so afraid of Rome that to harm a Roman citizen was thought to guarantee a total obliteration. So uh, I just wanted to throw that little bit of research mm -hmm. in there. Definitely. Um. See anyone else uh, have any thoughts they want to throw out? Well, I just wondered: uh, is there a is, are there an, are there descendants of of Asimov? Is anyone writing this sort of story anymore? Um, I, I uh, guess Abby Goldsmith is. I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, now. Because <laughs> you have a galactic empire. I haven't read your yeah. book, but from what I understand, it's a sort of that sort of thing, right? It is, yeah, and, and I I did think about okay, it's got to be limited to one galaxy, so how do I do that? And um, yeah, no hyperdrives, I'm using wormholes that are mapped by an ancient alien civilization that got destroyed. Yeah, well, and they're all uh, telepaths, right? Yes, yeah. So that 
yeah, that was interesting to me because the mule and the psycho historians of the second empire, which I'm not going to go into because of spoilers. Um, but yeah, there, I mean, there are some similarities there. <laughs> Yeah, with what I came up with. Well, so, I, yeah. I guess we haven't really clearly explained. So, so the mule is a uh, telepathic mutant, um, and so the reason that Harry Seldon's psychohistorical projections fail is because it assumes hu humans and doesn't account for, you know, sort of a superpowered mutant. Um, which again, I think is a really cool idea, um, and it does become necessary for Asimov to throw to keep throwing curveballs in there. Because by the time you get to the first story in the second book, the general, the characters have sort of realized that they don't actually have to the whole the whole it's sort of like a shaggy dog story, but but the characters go on this whole adventure to try to take down this um imperial general, only to realize that he was gonna fall regardless because of broader historical forces at play that that they that no one, no individual could really influence. Um, so to keep the story going from there, you got to throw in some more curveballs. Um, but, you know, the, the one thing, uh, that Asimov's story does is, um, you know, it engages with theories of history. Uh, you think about Marx and his, his theories of history or, or others. Uh, and, you know, I think we probably still are wondering how history works <laughs> and what, what, to what degree it's predictable and to what degree does history repeat itself? I asked him, I wrote an essay, I think, because someone complained that history doesn't really repeat itself. And he made a, uh, an analogy between the, the English revolution, the French revolution and the Russian revolution, trying to make the case that the same sorts of things or the same, even the same kinds of people appeared in all three uh, revolutions, even though they occurred over a period of 200 years. So apart. Uh, so, um, you know, I don't know, uh, you know, what, where, where we are on that. Uh, um, in, in, in a lot of ways that, that classic science fiction was, uh, about intellectual, uh, um, you know, thought experiments. Okay. Uh, which I think Asimov is, besides telling a, in an adventure story here, is, is trying to uh, uh, speculate about those things. Yeah, I was I was definitely thinking about Harry Seldon in terms of Marx because Marx, you know, had this idea of the dialectic and history is, you know, basically assured to uh, proceed along this certain uh, track because of you know unstoppable forces of social classes and, and so on, and. At least off the top of my head, I can't think of any other economists or historians or whatever who have had such a, you know, such a confidence in in projecting the course of future events. Uh, I don't know if anyone else can think of anyone, but well, the, the you know the Austrian school of economists they don't necessarily predict future events, but they say that you know markets are sort of like a force of nature, and that's they always work the same way, and they always produce optimal results uh in a state of uh what transparency and and uh i i you know i i don't know uh, it seems to me that that things are more complicated than that but i'm sort of a skeptic that that does remind me of the fact that um i think at one point samuel delaney gave an interview where he said that the one of the reasons that the foundation series has never been adapted into a big budget hollywood movie is that it would just instantly turn every every kid who watched it into a Marxist, which <laughs> I'm not convinced that that's the case. And I guess we'll, we'll get a test of that next year with Apple. But uh, I, I did think that was an interesting link because I don't necessarily think of these as particularly Marxist books. But then when you make that sort of comparison in terms of thinking about historical processes, that, that makes a lot of sense. And I mean, the one other thing that John's point made me think about was also how um, and, and why, even though <laughs> there's certainly lots of quibbles and, and shortcomings that we've brought up. Um, one of the reasons I love these books so much is because Asimov in general is, is one of these sort of classic science fiction writers who approaches, who's, who's, who sees story structures as, as like basically being about problems to solve and mysteries to solve. And the foundation stories apply that on a historical level that they say that, you know, at this point in history, here's the problem we must solve. 50 years later, at this point in history, here's the problem we must solve. And I'm not necessarily convinced that that's an accurate model of history, but as a reading experience, I just can't think of anything that's exactly like that. And I just 
love it so much. And it totally just like every time I, I, I get caught up, even in the, in the first book, because we were talking about this idea that until this point, there's, there's not really traditional tension because you've, you've figured out um, at, at a certain point, you figure out that the, the Selden plan will ensure the foundation wins every time, but there's still like a satisfaction to it in the way that in a mystery, in a, a sort of classic Agatha Christie mystery, you know that the detective is going to solve the mystery at the end, but there's pleasure in seeing how they figure it out. Like I still really love those stories where, especially in retrospect, you, you feel like the outcome is completely predetermined. Um, and, and so even though I, I certainly love the mule and think it's, it's one of the best stories in this series, I, I, I think that there's an interesting tension in the earlier stories too. Let me just, before we go on, I want to, the thing about the um, Samuel Delaney's point about how everyone would become a Marxist if they read Foundation, just a counterpoint to that. I don't know if you know, there's a conservative economist named Tyler Cowen, and he has his list of 10 favorite science fiction novels. And number two, he says, Isaac Asimov, original Foundation trilogy. No, the books didn't make me want to become an economist. And in fact, when I read them at age 14, I recoiled at their historicist, anti-Hayekian and anti-Paparian nature. Um, so there's a, a, a counterpoint. <laughs> well, we see the, the hardcore libertarian free marketers, uh, Hayek worshipers, they have a infallible system that works 100% of the time in every possible circumstance. So it's, I don't think they're that different from Harry Seldon. But I guess we better not go political here. Yeah, I, I honestly, I don't know enough about Hayek to really offer an informed uh, opinion. Um, Abby, were you going to say something? Oh, um, yeah. I mean, I was going to go off a little bit about sociological science fiction, which... No, go for it. Yeah, like I, I thought this was a good, a really good example of sociological science fiction. And I like that everything about the Selden crises and, you know, even though he's not a character writer, the story centers on individuals and on characters. Um, like, you know, what, like it's all about the personalities involved, you know, and Selden is predicting these big sweeping historical events that are going to happen, but he's basically predicting personalities that will arise, you know, clashes that will arise. They're the kind of clashes that have happened all throughout history. They're not dependent on the technology. And um, I like that about it. I, I especially liked how the mule was kind of like he he manipulates emotions, not thoughts, it's emotions. And, you know, he's kind of like a master of, you know, how like what emotions can do to people. And I, I just thought it was it was good. It was insightful in that way, which you don't usually see with hard science fiction. Yeah, actually, um, uh, when I, you know, I sent you guys, um, I asked our listeners what they thought of Foundation. And uh, one, one San Miguel says, the mule is one of the best SF villains of all time. He is not two dimensional, which, um, you know, especially by the end of that, you know, novella, um, you know, he, he, he seems very sort of, what's the word, like pathetic, like, you know, sort of like, um, yeah, I guess pathetic, but sort of, you know, like, he's clearly the bad guy but he i guess we've seen he we see him we've seen him as sort of like a uh you know mistreated misunderstood vengeful when i read that uh, yes go ahead go ahead john i'm just saying when i read it even as a teenager i wanted the mule to win and, and completely <laughs> defeat the foundation i was tired of the foundation already by the end of the first book <laughs> so so i wanted somebody to, to, to mess it up uh yeah, well, it was hard for me not to read that as Asimov persona, you know, like identifying with that character to some extent, which sort of ties in with the whole like fans or slans sort of idea, you know, that probably a lot of science fiction can fans can identify with the mistreated, misunderstood, mentally powerful <laughs> sort of character, right? That's that's yeah. that's right. <laughs> um there was one other thing I saw on Wikipedia where they said um, that that the foundation stories had actually been influential on real science. I should have cut and pasted the actual quote, but this idea that the um, the psychohistorical projections are accurate unless the people themselves know what the psychohistorical projections are, in which case that throws the whole thing out of whack. That I think there are branches of you know of sociology or something where where similar principles uh, were kind of developed later that that you know that apply 
uh, certainly a lot of uh, psychological experiments, uh, they'll have people come in and to do something and they're told they're doing one thing, mm, but yeah. they're actually measuring something completely different. So they don't want them to know what they're really testing. Yeah. Uh, see another listener comment here is Dustin L. Tabor says, I'm finally going through the foundation series right now in Asimov's suggested order. And I read that and I was like, oh, crap, there's a suggested order. <laughs> Why does nobody ever tell me these things? Um, so, so Anthony, do you know what the suggested order is? I assume that what he's talking about is that I, I think at a certain point towards the end of his life, um, uh, he, uh, Asimov, like, I think in one of his introductions said, you know, here's sort of chronologically how all these books fit together, because part of what he was doing in the eighties when he returned to science fiction was, um, basically taking the robot series and the uh, foundation series and turning them into one series and connecting them. And so then he created this chronology of like, here's how it all fits together. And, and within the foundation, part of what that means is that the last two books he wrote are, are prequels about Harry Selden prelude to foundation and for the foundation. And so I assume that theoretically this, this reader could be reading those prequels first, which I strongly do. I mean, in general, I'm a big fan of reading things in order of composition and or publication rather than internal chronology. And I think that is definitely true here, partly just because I think the, the core ideas and what, what is so strong about the series are, are in the original trilogy, not in the sequels and prequels he wrote later. Yeah. And just to explain, so Asimov had two big series, the robot novels and the foundation novels. And the robot novels are set in the relatively near future and have robots. And the foundation novels are set in the far, far future and don't have robots. And so at some point in his career, he decided to explain how we got from one to the other. And having not read any of those books, I, I don't actually know what it is. But And don't tell me because no spoilers. But um, do you find it satisfying the, the way it all connects um, ultimately? I, it, it was, I think to me, because I wasn't thinking as much about sort of the composition and to me, they were all kind of, that when I discovered them, all of the books, this was, would have been in the, the, I guess, mid to late nineties, um, all the books had been written. Um, and so they were already sort of stitched together into this one series. So it didn't, it wasn't as clear to me that it was as retroactive as, as it is. And so to me, it, it seemed fine. I don't think like the explanations are amazing. Um, I think, I mean, they do. The one thing I will say for them is they reflect. And I, uh, the, the idea that in both cases, when he returned to the series in the eighties, he was interrogating the ideas that he brought to them in the forties and fifties and saying, okay, do those ideas really hold up? And so in that sense, I think there's, there's something interesting about asking, you know, in the case of, the robot series, you know, should the robots really be subservient to the humans or is it more the other way around in the case of the foundation series? Like is psychohistory really the best path forward? And so that, that's interesting the way he tried to, tries to bring those to answer those questions while also tying the series together. But looking back now, like, and, and, and like I said, having reread the trilogy and then foundation's edge, it really sticks out to me that in the first three books, there are no, no robots and no sense that it connects to that earlier series. And then you get to foundation's edge and suddenly you get these, you know, little subtle nods towards robots that to me, you know, I, I could just see him working to make that happen. And I wasn't crazy about it. Hmm. Um, I guess earlier, John was asking, are, are people still doing this kind of thing? Is that, is that, is that a fair paraphrase of your question yes i you know i i confess that i'm i'm not reading any series of uh, uh you know uh galactic empire sort of stories i i read the uh, uh some of uh, the uh culture books but then not not since then so i don't know whether this thing is still still going yeah. on well what i kept thinking of reading this was um a memory called empire by arkady martin who i just i interviewed a couple like a, i don't know a month or two ago and that's great like if you like Galactic Empires. Uh, I mean, that's a terrific example of a recent, you know, a recent science fiction novel that deals with one. Um, I mean, I'd say it's more, you know, the, like the foundation is very sort of humanist, kind of techno optimist in its outlook, and um, uh, a memory called Empire is is not. So, uh, you know, it's not going to 
you know, I mean, the, the culture books, I think, would be more more kind of in that vein, I guess. But um, I don't know if anyone else anyone else read any good Galactic Empire books recently. I have not. I, mean, I, I really enjoyed um, A Fire Upon the Deep by Werner Vinge, which is not that, you know, it's, it's kind of old at this point. I think it came out in the 90s. Um, but he has quite a Galactic Empire. Then, of course, you know, Dan Simmons. Um, more recently, I don't know. You know, I'm hypercritical as a reader. So, actually, my my old mentor James Gunn, who's probably the oldest science fiction writer in the, he's in his late nineties now. Uh, wrote three novels, uh, the tr- transcendence novels that that are set in a galactic empire future. Yeah, huh. Yeah, cool. So, so Anthony, you haven't read it because this is like one of your favorite series of all time. You haven't sought out any other. Uh, <laughs> well, I Empire. would. Um, I would actually say that the the obvious example um, influence is the the Three Body Problem series, um, which is I guess was originally published in in China in the in the mid aughts, but was published in the U.S. a bit more recently, and um, I think has a, a you know is very different because I think it pays much more close attention to hard science. Um, it has aliens and it exists at least in the early books in this universe where um light speed is a firm limit on on travel but i think there's a similar kind of sweep and there's a similar approach to the idea of like we're going to there's a series of historical problems to solve and in fact that at one point in the second book one of the characters gives a copy of the foundation trilogy to osama bin laden it's it's a really weird book um but uh, so I, I think there's a there. That, I actually think Shishin Lu is probably a, a, a. I don't think he's doing pure Asimov riffs, but I think you can see the influence there. Hmm. Yeah, unfortunately, I haven't had a chance to read those yet. Maybe for oh, a future must. book club episode, we can do that. Um, because yeah, like I was telling you, I was telling you guys that since I've you know done this podcast for the last ten years and have almost exclusively read new authors so that I could talk to them about their, their new books that just came out. Uh, I haven't read a lot of, uh, you know, there's just a lot of stuff I missed that was either classics or award winners and things like that. So, yeah, I got to start doing some book club episodes so I can sort of fill in some holes in my reading. Um, yeah, I have a bunch more notes here. Let's see. Uh, I thought it was funny that, um, uh, Wikipedia noted, uh, on the entry for Foundation, it says, In July 2012, io9 included the book on its list of 10 science fiction novels you pretend to have read. <laughs> so, I don't know if that applies to anyone here just pretending to have read this book. You tell me, I won't. I, won't, I, won't I pretend to remember now. the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'll, I'll admit, you know, I read it as a teenager and I was like, yeah, I read it, but I don't think it counts at this point. <laughs> did you, like, what did you remember? Like, what stuck out from the book? That it was extremely dry. I could barely understand what was happening. Um, I remember the mule was a sympathetic character. and I, I did, re- like, that was like the only memory I had of the entire thing. So... I don't think it counts. <laughs> <laughs> um, I thought one thing that this uh, this series did really well that I hadn't really thought about, especially since, as I said, I had only read the first two stories, is that Harry Seldon establishes this foundation to um, safeguard scientific knowledge into the future. And um, and I think the the stories do a really good job of, of giving you the sense of how hard it would be to set up something that's supposed to last into the future and have your descendants actually stick with the program and not descend into bickering or, you know, power grabs and to, to stick with the, um, <laughs> the mission that you want them to. And I don't think I'd ever really thought about how, how hard that would be and how many things could go wrong, um, before reading, uh, reading through all the stories in this book. Yeah. It's kind of well, like I a religious it's... cult. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And it's, I think, just an evocative, such an evocative idea, too, of, you know, the fact that he doesn't, I mean, in in some ways, there's some religious overtones to this as well, but that he's somebody who doesn't actually, he doesn't even go to Terminus, where the the first foundation is established, that he uh, comes up with a plan and 
sets it into motion and then dies. And and there's, to me, there's something just really beautiful and sad about that. Mm-hmm. Um, John, you have any thoughts about that? How hard it is to get the stupid kids to uh, stick at the program? Well, you know, human beings, I mean, we, we set up political entities, you know, I think about uh, the Constitution is sort of a foundation, isn't it? Uh, yeah. uh, the, you know, the United States, and and uh, you know, we keep trying to uh, uh, follow what they said we should be doing, and uh, but people misinterpret it or interpret it in different ways, or or uh, or use it to their own purposes. They're not really caring about what happened before, or what comes after, but just trying to get influence and power for themselves. And I suppose that that's a, you know, that's a real thing in human behavior. Uh, I think Asimov is aware of that. Uh, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know. I thought this was a, I, I really liked this detail where um, uh, this is a description of one of the characters. It says as secretary to the mayor, he had held off opposition councilmen, job seekers, reformers, and crackpots who claim to have solved in its entirety the course of future history as worked out by Harry Seldon. And <laughs> yeah. I thought that was such a great detail because it makes the world feel real. Because you're like, oh, yeah, in this world, that's exactly what would happen. You would have people coming in all the time saying, like, oh, I know what Harry Seldon wants us to do. You know, do what I want because, like, it's Harry, so it's not me saying it, it's Harry Seldon, you know. <laughs> yeah. But see, that's like a, a little bit, a little line that Asimov throws off there, there could be a whole uh, story right there, you know, an episode. <laughs> uh, uh, so it seems to me that, that uh, there's a lot of things I, and reading it again, that it struck me that Asimov for a young man who didn't really get out in the world very much. Uh, I thought that he had some fairly astute political observations um, and certainly things that he might have just passed over lightly, but that have large implications and that, that are worth thinking about. Yeah, I was pretty astounded that these were written in his 20s and he had such a grasp of politics and court intrigue and, you know, po- you know political machinations and all that kind of stuff. Uh, clearly a, a really, really smart person. And like I, I was especially, you know, because I've been doing this podcast for 10 years and I work around the clock on it and I've put out. 424 episodes and in his life he wrote and edited something like 500 books and I'm like wait how is that how is that even possible like you know that's like writing a you know right like writing a book every three weeks or something like i don't even i don't know i don't know i don't know what <laughs> obviously an impressive impressive guy well the other thing that is not exactly the same thing but that i've been thinking a lot about lately is that i am 37 and will be 38 in january and that that asimov has these like fairly distinct phases in his career where up until 1958 he was primarily a science fiction writer while all, but what during towards the end of that period expanding into nonfiction especially popular science and then for the from the 60s and 70s he's almost exclusively focused on science and then he returns to science fiction in the 80s. And one of the results of that is basically that everything that I think he is and will be remembered for, he'd written by the time he turned 38. And I just think about that and get incredibly depressed. And oh, the youngest no. person on this panel. <laughs> right. <laughs> You're welcome, everyone. <laughs> well, I mean, I hate to admit it, but uh, two, two days ago, I turned 70. <laughs> Happy and birthday! So, yeah, I feel like okay, that yeah, careers in the rearview mirror there. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you know, it is true that writers tend to produce their their seminal works, uh, you know, before they're forty, and then yeah, George uh, R. Martin, uh, right, <laughs> right, and, and now they may reach till that soil then for the next thirty years. But but they they don't generally come up with brand new uh, uh, con- conceptions or make sudden left turns uh, in, into areas that they had never ever explored uh, when they were younger. So certainly scientists. I mean that's the other thing. It's notorious in science that if you haven't made your big breakthrough by the time you're 35, you're not going to do it. Now there are some exceptions, but mostly it's true. Um, I don't know. Well- yeah. Well, let me say, John, I mean, I read your novel, The Moon and the Other, which you just published what, was it, like one or two years ago, right? 
Yeah. Um, I, which I thought was terrific. And I mean, you know, I would say I've, I haven't read all your earlier work, but I would I certainly I would imagine it's as good as anything else you've written. I think um, it might be my best book. So. Yeah. And especially like just on a, um, you know, on, on the level of prose style and characterization and, and stuff like that, it's like just so far beyond um, foundation, in my opinion. And, you know, if I were I, 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 I was sort of reading this wondering, you know, because foundation is such a. Um, you know, so associated with science fiction, I, I just I wonder how many people um, are like, oh, let me look, check out science fiction. This is a classic of science fiction. And they start reading it and they're just like, what the what is this? You know, yeah. <laughs> and like how many people have been turned off of reading science fiction because of foundation, much as I much as I enjoyed it. Whereas, you know, I would much rather they read read the moon and the other or something like that, which I think would be, you know. Uh, would not well, you know, there has been a lot of evolution in science fiction in the last 70 years. And so, you know, I can't blame Asimov for writing in his 20s uh, in pulp magazines in the 1940s in a way that we don't, you know, right now or, or at least. Uh, um, so, uh, you know, I guess what I'm saying is that uh, we all evolve um, and I don't know. I didn't. I didn't write as fast as Asimov. I didn't, I'm never <laughs> going to write 500 books. Okay, <laughs> so so I spent 20 years writing that book. So uh, you know that's why it's probably denser uh, with things than than uh, most of what Asimov wrote. Yeah, I'm certainly not blaming him like personally or anything, but um, no. I, I just I I do sort of wonder if that is something that has been happening. You know. Well, and I think I mean that's part of. Um this broader conversation that's been happening around the science fiction canon and that, you know, that there's maybe a, a group of um, fans and writers and critics who think that everyone should start with Asimov and, and Heinlein. And as much as I love Asimov and, and did start with him, like I would absolutely not advocate that for everyone. And that of course, like the place that people should start with science fiction is, you know, the best of what people are writing now, just because, especially I think if you're, 13 or 14, or I mean, I think really any age, like probably the thing you respond to the most are the people who are living through the times you're living in and responding to the same ideas you are. And so, the, you know, the idea that there's only sort of one gateway through science fiction, and it's basically through these two guys and, and maybe Arthur C. Clarke, I think maybe I, I sort of question whether that ever really held up. But certainly, I think in the last few years, a lot of people have been pushing back against that idea. Yeah, I would also say like, the science ideas, you know, like he, I, Asimov keeps, keeps mentioning nucleix, you know, because nuclear science was a new thing at the time. Um, and the miniaturization, you know, saying like, like, instead of going larger and larger, things are getting smaller and smaller, which, you know, the advent of computing was a thing, but that's not going to resonate with today's audiences. No, I completely agree that, you know, if you're a young person, you don't want it you don't want to be assigned that you have to read, you know, uh, Robert Heinlein's novels at the age 13, you, you find the things that, that excite you. Um, and, you know, maybe I think it's good to remember these writers and to, uh, you know, to, as someone said earlier in our conversation that coming back to Asimov, now you read it more in an academic way. Is it Abby? You said that. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and uh, you know, you sort of see it from the outside a little more than you did when you were 12. Uh, uh, you know, I was I was I was the right age to read Asimov, you know, in the 60s. Uh, but um, but, you know, I, I think it's it's good to remember these things and to read them and to see sometimes they'll surprise you with some things that that, uh, you know, uh, uh, you don't see today that are that are interesting. But by and large, I think that there's too many good writers going at it today and and doing, you know, fresher, fresher work. Yeah. Although, let me say, I mean, you know, as I said, I was expecting this to be a slog. And once I got it was sort of a slog for me, as I said, in the kind of the third um, story in the first book. But once I got past that, I was pretty into it. And especially by the time I got to the end of the second book, I was really, really into it. And I mean, for me, it's it's more like the yeah, the style and the characterization and stuff that would be a, an issue. Like, I don't really feel like, yeah, the characters like smoke and they read newspapers and all that kind of stuff. But I don't feel like for me that that's really much of an issue. You can just sort of like you know, mentally rewrite newspaper to a laptop or like whatever, his phone, you know, like, like, like those aren't the things that really trip me up um, at all. 
And I, I just, I don't know. Yeah, I, I definitely like read these two books and I'm like, okay, I can see why they're all, why they're on all these best lists, why so many people have been, oh, you have to read this. I mean, because, because so many ideas are, are so brilliant um, in these two books. And it definitely made me want to keep reading. You know, it's kind of sad that we had to go ahead and re record this before I could have gotten around to reading the third one. Um, Anthony, do you, um, you said that you, do you, like, how do you, how good do you think the later books are? Like, would you say like, oh, you have to read the third one and then you could kind of like read the other ones if you want, or like you have to read them all. Like kind of what's your opinion about that? Yeah, I would say that, uh, I would, you can stop with three. I mean, I think that the later books are, are fine. They're not bad. They're not like, you're, they're not going to feel like a betrayal of the earlier books. So if you want to keep going by all means, but I think of the first three books as really like one whole unit, which is why I re I always just reread them as one story in the same way that I sort of think of like, you know, Lord of the Rings is, I mean, they're slightly different because Lord of the Rings was written in its entirety before it was published, but it, it still has that feeling to me of, of being one long story that I don't divide into three books. Um, whereas, and, and the, and the end of second foundation to me is the real ending of the trilogy and then everything else is sort of a postscript. I was also just curious. I remember when this book came out, but I never read it. But there was a book called A Psychohistorical Crisis by Donald Kingsbury, which is sort of like set in the Foundation universe. I was just curious if anyone ever read that or heard of it. Have not read it. No, I think I, I think have, I have that on my list, but. <laughs> I think I saw it, um, you know, obviously the title grabbed my attention, but when I, at least when I looked at it glancingly, it didn't seem as connected to the foundation as I'd hoped. So I was like, oh, never mind. Uh, Abby, you said it's on your to be read list or something? Um, Donald Kingsbury is, and I had no idea about that. So I'm going to have to look into that. Oh, you said, now, you, now that I mentioned it, you're saying it's on your to read list? Yes. Yeah, okay. All right. Yeah. Well, that's why people listen to this podcast, to get some <laughs> reading recommendations. No, books that I haven't actually read. Um, Someone should say something about Anthony's little essay he wrote about uh, Asimov. I thought that was very interesting. Uh, yeah, so Anthony wrote an essay on TechCrunch called Reading Isaac Asimov at 100 because Asimov would be, I guess, 100 years old this year. Um, yes. So, yeah, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I mean, it was essentially because I'd, I'd written a, sort of another appreciation for him a, a few years ago, and I think that in the light of, you know, the kind of broader conversations around diversity in science fiction and, and the, the broader and the Me Too movement, um, uh, it had sort of really made me reconsider a lot of the things that about my feelings about him, because, you know, for the longest time, and I, he was probably my favorite writer, and maybe now he's not quite on the top spot, but he's definitely still in the top tier for me. And um, so there, I think there have been a number of sort of people talking about their experiences with Asimov at conventions and, and, um, but I think in, um, Alec Navalo Lee's book, Astounding, which is about the kind of golden age of science fiction and specifically Campbell, Asimov, Heinlein, and L. Ron Hubbard, um, he, he really kind of just lays it all out and makes it very clear that, um, Asimov was somebody who, uh, groped a lot of women in his lifetime and was enabled by, um, you know, that everyone in the community kind of knew about it and was just like, oh, that's just Isaac. He's the man with a thousand hands. He's the, we should have a, um, a panel for, they, I think in the early 60s, they, they wanted to have a panel for him at the World Science Fiction Convention called the Positive Power of Posterior Pinching. Um, and so I, you know, and, and it, it, realizing that also made me re look at a lot of his writing really differently because he talks about this in his own autobiographical writing about how he's, a flirt and, and, but a harmless flirt. Right. And, and so I suddenly, a lot of the things that seemed like funny stories when he told them <laughs> looked a lot less funny. And, and so um, basically that essay was me trying to just make sense of all those really conflicted feelings, you know, partly because it's not just that I love a set of novels, but that it's, I love the sort of body of work. I love his voice. And so just trying to, except that, especially because, you know, he, he's dead, he's not somebody who's gonna, ever going to like sort of face consequences for his actions. Like, it, it's really just trying to go into it with, with wide eyes wide open and say, like, I'm not going to pretend that these things didn't happen. Um, and I know that there are people who have said that they basically cannot read Asimov now because they, they see him essentially as a sexual predator. 
Um, and I'm never going to try to dissuade anyone from that. But that for me, it's about sort of just trying to understand the totality of that. Yeah, I haven't read that the um, Alec Naval Lee book, so I, I don't really know the details, but it was sort of, um, you know, something he, he sort of like, like, seems almost reveled in kind of his dirty old man persona. Is that is that sort of yes. accurate? Yeah, I think that's that's right. And that he, um, you know, it, it seems like he basically, um, a, you know, like would, would basically he, he saw that he saw himself as, as fundamentally harmless and, um, you know, like like meaning well. And, and I mean, he identified as a feminist and also, as, as you said, I mean, I think he also identified with a mule as somebody who just had was was very neglected by women and and was inexperienced in his early life and and so when he ha was given these opportunities to be famous author like um he would <laughs> he he took advantage of them and i mean i think sometimes that was that was verbal and sometimes that was physical um and and so like it it was this thing where at least as i understand it that yeah he saw it as i, I think that if we if we asked if he was still alive and we asked him he genuinely saw all of that as um, harmless, but but certainly there have been people who've come forward you know, and talked about encountering him at conventions in the 60s and 70s and said that he basically insisted on grabbing them inappropriately and, and you know, would become very upset if they resisted him. And and so, like, it, it's sort of just really troubling to think about how, from his perspective, it can be one way, but of course, that's not a defense and that's not how, at least, it's not to say that everyone saw him this way or or any of that, but that um, that certainly there were some people, it sounds like, who really had upsetting encounters with him. I mean, one thing that really struck me reading these two books is the almost total absence of sex. I mean, like, um, you know, I, I think so much pulp science fiction would tend to have really sort of lascivious descriptions of all the female characters, and these don't. And there's actually like one line that really struck me because um, uh, Beta and her husband are on... Um, like on a, a resort planet and it just mentions that he's sunbathing nude and it just kind of like really jumped out at me because it was the only um line in the entire 600 pages where you would <laughs> know that humans were sexual or you know in any or you know that even like would bring that to mind so it's just sort of interesting to me that that these books are so non-sexual when apparently he was you know had had issues with that and Can i just say Harden and Weenus. <laughs> <laughs> okay, grant, aside, aside from those two character names, I guess. But um, um, but I, I do wonder, since these books were written, um, you know, when he was like, you know, twenty to thirty-one, it, if this was like before that, I don't know. But is that is, were these written before that behavior started or not? That's my sense. Is and he even talks about in his autobiography, not so much that behavior, but he talks about like that, you know, one of the other issues in his marriage was that it was not a particularly sexually satisfying marriage. And that I think he was a, he was a virgin when he got married. And then um, in the fifties, he actually began um, a, a series of affairs. And so it, it, at least even in his own narrative, I think the thirties is the period when he kind of, I think in a way discovered his own sexuality. I, you know, I, I met Asimov a number of times, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, I actually didn't didn't know per se about this groping business, but but he absolutely was a flirt. Uh, I, I remember I introduced him to my then wife in the 80s at a Nebula Awards conference, and he instantly made up a little dirty limerick with her name uh, there and, you know, sort of smiled and, you know, and wink, wink, nudge, and nudge. And, uh, you know, it but it did seem and I hate to be a person of my generation it did seem didn't seem as as bad as as it it clearly was okay and and looking at back on it you know i i think a lot of us in the whole culture of science fiction accepted things that now we realize were should have been unacceptable but it was it, you know that's that line uh, that lp hartley wrote the past is another country they do things differently there it's not to excuse these behaviors but Asimov comes out of a world that thinks that at least a lot of men and a lot of in institutions and a lot of uh, you know 
what ordinary uh, art and behavior thinks that this is this is uh, this is normal, uh, and maybe a little bit uh, you know uh, uh, off color or you know not not uh, something that you want to boast about. But there were people who boasted about it. So I, I you know I guess what I'm I'm trying to say is that. Um, the world has changed and, and, and for good reason. Uh, but at the time, I don't think people saw this the way we do now. Surprise. I mean, it's, it's not, I mean, we shouldn't be surprised because we see it all the time now. Uh, it, it, I just hope that, uh, the culture will change permanently. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're way over time. We need to wrap this up, but I'll just, uh, okay. I'll just let's, 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 um, I'll say a couple more things or we can say a couple more things, but I, you know, like Anthony and I, for, um, a recent panel, we watched the, um, invasion of the body snatchers from the fifties. And there's just this like unbelievably bizarre moment where there's this little kid who comes into the doctor and, um, and he says, you know, my mom has been replaced by aliens or something. And the doctor's like, no, you're crazy and sends him on his way. And then, and he's sort of giving him a pep talk, you know, and then on the way out, as the kid's walking out, and this is a kid is like nine years old or something, the doctor just gives him a smack on the butt. And it's just, you're just like, like, and it's, it's not within the context of the movie, this isn't meant to imply anything other than this doctor is like a cool guy who has a great rapport with his patients, you know, and it's just like to, to John's thing about the past is a different country. It's like, whole, you know, you just watch that now you're just like, what the, this, this was ever considered like you know, something that would pass without comment, you know? Um, so yeah. Um, but I, I want to give, give Abby a chance to, to get in here too. Um, but, uh, Abby, any, any final thoughts here on, on all this stuff? Um, no, I mean, I don't think so. Like, like approaching it with that academic mindset. Um, you know, I've, I've read other classic authors and this doesn't seem anything out of the ordinary to me. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, why don't we uh, we wrap this up and maybe we can come back to some of this stuff in a future episode. Um, but so just on this whole subject of foundation and these first two books in the series, um, Abby, final thoughts on this whole experience of reading these two books? Yeah, I'm glad I did. Um, I found them a lot more enjoyable than I did when I was a teenager. Um, and I got a lot out of them. And I'm actually reading the third one now and enjoying it. Yeah, I can't wait till I can't wait till I'm reading the third one and enjoying it along with you. Um, John, final thoughts? Um, I also enjoyed reading them, not having read them in a long time. Uh, it did make me think an awful lot about how the present is different from the past, and science fiction is different than it was then. Uh, but they're still living uh, books, it seems to me. There's things going on there that that are not just of historical interest that are 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 interesting for other reasons. But as an English professor, you know, I spent my life. Uh, studying old books and and really reading through the books to the culture out of which they arose and that's a very interesting thing to do so i was sort of doing that with with this as well i had a double vision in other words part of me was still a science fiction reader reading it for the science fiction story and the other part of me was sort of the english professor or historian a person of our time looking back on on another era yeah cool and so about anthony final thought yeah, I mean, um, obviously, I like these books and stories a lot. And maybe the the thing I would end on is I think a lot of times people talk about Asimov and specifically the foundation stories as being very dry and intellectual. And I know that can certainly be the case for a lot of readers. But for whatever reason, that has never been the case for me that they're just pure pleasure that there's no effort involved. I just pick them up and I'm, you know, halfway through the second book and and maybe at least some of your listeners that will be true for them as well yeah yeah let me just say again you know that i uh as i said i was expecting this to be a slog and ended up really appreciating why these books are considered classics and um yeah i i did it did definitely make me want to keep reading more of them so i don't know maybe we can come back and do this again sometime um you know if i ever read the third one or when the uh, yes. the tv show comes out or something like that um, but, uh, yeah, I think we're going to have to wrap things up there. So we've been speaking with Anthony Ha, John Kessel, and Abby Goldsmith. So thanks, everyone, so much for joining us. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you. And that was our panel. So big thanks again to Anthony Ha, John Kessel, and Abby Goldsmith for joining us on the show. 
And remember that Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time contribution, you can do that via check or PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. All right, so that was our show. So thanks everyone for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.